in the heart of the Rockies. If it could go wrong, it's going to go wrong. Raging blizzards. You add in the extra snow, you have tons to worry about. Perilous descents. It's downhill from here. And treacherous mountain tunnels. They're kind of scary. You could film a horror movie in them. Threaten to derail a crucial 15,000 ton delivery of grain from the prairies to the west coast. There's a lot of pressure on everybody. It's busy. Grain keeps us going, that's for sure. Yeah. We have to be on point, work fast, and get her done so we don't hold up any trains. That's just a ton of snow. High in the Rocky Mountains. Intense blizzards have been hammering Canadian Pacific's railroad crews for three days nonstop. It's nature. You can't predict nature. As snow continues to pound the mountains, the teams fan out to fight back. 250 kilometers east of the snow zone in the prairies. 1042 east, clear signal to Delmead. Oh. We're descending right now. <laughs> He's in charge of the train. Anything with the locomotives or power is mine. Conductor Sean Davis and veteran engineer Glenn Getz are hauling their two kilometer long train to a grain elevator outside Calgary. We're holding 5,180 tons. And that's all empty grain cars at the moment. They've got 112 empty cars to fill with 15,000 tons of grain. They need to get this precious load 1,000 kilometers west across the country to the Pacific coast. From the pickup point outside Calgary, the crew must guide the heavy train up elevations of 1,600 meters into the heart of the ice-encrusted Rocky Mountains, down steep terrain, through winding mountain passes, to reach a transport ship waiting at the port of Vancouver. Any delay to the ship's departure will cost Canadian grain dealers as much as $25,000 a day in docking fees. There's a lot of pressure on everybody. You want to get out there and get, get it done SAP? It's busy. Grain keeps us going, that's for sure. Yeah. Prairie farmers export around $30 billion worth of grain to over 100 countries every year. More than 95% of it travels across the country by rail. So it's an indispensable service for Canadian grain growers. The wheat is world famous, but so is the journey. No other country on earth transports its grain as far to get to market. We're about a mile and a half away. You can see the grain elevator on the left there. That's where we're going to be stopping. The quicker we get the job done, the quicker they can get the grain loaded and gone. Bottom line, we work as a team. So it's, That's right. I've got a job to do on the ground. He's got a job to do up here. Just get the job done as safely as we can. Go home with all our fingers and toes. West of the Rockies, high in the Selkirk Mountains, more than two feet of snow fell on the tracks last night, right where the grain train is headed. Derek Moore and his 25-year-old apprentice, Brett Fair, have been called in to blast the snow off the tracks. All right, proceeding through Yoho. Their 260 horsepower snow fighter is equipped with three blades to push the snow and ice five meters away from the tracks. I love operating machinery, and uh, getting to do it on track is just a bonus. It's a challenge. Steep grades, tight corners. You add in the extra snow, you have tons to worry about. I'm from Ontario, came out here in 2008, and I wouldn't change anything. I love the mountains. My stepfather was a railroader for 35 years, and he's the one that got me on. I still have my toy CP train set from when I was a kid. Learning the job is a lot harder than learning the machine. Learning how to move snow, what to do with it, and how to get it where you want it to go is way harder than just pushing a control and moving it forward and backward. 
What kid can't say no to driving a yellow Tonka truck all the time? It's the most fun I've ever had. As he clears the snow, we'll proceed east. Derek must check the switches that route the trains between different tracks. Right on. We're going to go out and make sure this switch is looking good. Do you just want to make sure you're clear of any obstruction? Um, Let's just try to open it. Are you kidding me? A heavy coating of ice has locked it up. Oh, man. East in the prairies. Hey, C48, you can pull her head. It's go time for Sean and Glenn. One more. They have just two hours to set up their train. Obviously, you don't want this stuff sitting around because if you're not moving, you're not making money. About 10 more to stop. Hey, stop it. C48, five to go. As soon as those cars show up, we're trying to get on top of it as quick as we can and get them loaded. Steel cables drag the empty cars under the loaders that fill them with grain. You got two thirds. Facility manager Cody Swear has to keep a close eye on all the moving parts. I'm watching all of our drags and belts and motors and making sure nothing's overloaded and just oversee all the guys and make sure everything's going right. a bit too long here, then it's going to take longer elsewhere, and it's just kind of dominoes. It just kind of falls apart everywhere else and makes everything else delayed. This is Amber Durham. This is what we're shipping right now. It's going to be tight, but I think we'll get it done on time. So far, nothing's gone wrong. Every year, more than 400,000 cars get loaded here. One car alone is worth $30,000. I've probably done 25 on my track, and he's probably done about the same, almost halfway. We're ready to go on one. Now what? Hey, Michael. Go ahead. Can you see if uh, Brian's track's got a leaker there or no? Cody spots grain on the track. One of the cars is leaking. Hopefully, Michael can get down there in a hurry, because we're falling a little bit behind, and we need to get going here. We really have no idea which car it is, so we're right on top of it. A leak can be pretty bad, because it's going all the way back to the coast, so we could lose an entire car. And there's a lot of money in these cars. Just outside Calgary, the hunt is on for a leaking grain car. Wait a sec. Right here, here's the leak. Michael needs to crank the hopper door shut before they lose any more grain. We check the bottoms to make sure that all the cars are closed, but sometimes it's just a little sliver that we can't see or that we miss. It's a small leak, but uh, if we didn't catch it or find it, that hopper of that car would have been empty by the time it got to Vancouver. Nine more cars to go. Oh, you're done, uh, Brian. Finally, all 112 cars are filled with $4 million worth of grain and heading west. We're done here. A new crew begins the long haul to Vancouver. For 15,000 tons of grain. It rests on the shoulders of veteran engineer Rob Panos and 29-year-old rookie conductor Kerry Illick to make the ascent into the Rockies. There's snow and ice build up, so there is a struggle for sure. Just make sure you hang on. I'm the engineer. I've been here for 35 years now. Basically, I 
control the speed and try to keep the train in one piece so that the conductor does not have to fix it. <laughs> I still enjoy the job. No two trips are the same. Driving the train into these rugged mountains is familiar ground for Rob, but not for Carrie, who used to work on a farm. This is my second trip. Before here, I was a pen rider in a feedlot, so made a living off the back of a horse. So this is a big change for me. You can't get much newer than her. <laughs> Definitely still in the learning process, shall we say. And so far, she's been doing a very good job. I'm a brand new conductor. Six weeks of classroom work, lots of exams, going on lots of rides with a coach who's showing you what to do along the way. Clear signal. Clear. As a conductor, lots of it is calling out your signals to notify my engineer knowing what the train consists of, if you've got dangerous loads, grain, whatever you are. There's just so many different situations you can get put in on the railroad. There's not a lot of near-miss accidents or small incidents. Things can go wrong very easily in a very short period of time. The deeper they go, the more unpredictable this wilderness becomes. For us, there are bears. It's a grizzly around mile 100. Usually you see elk, deer, black bears, grizzly bears. Almost all the animals are attracted to grain. That's why they try to keep the tracks clean of grain. As they climb higher into the snow zone. Emergency broadcast. Oh, man. Where are we? Well, 170. They rehearse an emergency call. Good to go. Emergency, emergency. Emergency test, emergency test 8708 West is at mile 117, 117. They're a long way from any town. Radio contact here can mean the difference between life and death. Testing the emergency call. Over. Successful test, thanks for your help. Successful test, thank you. It is a dangerous job. The equipment we're dealing with, the lightest piece is about 30 tons. You make a mistake around here, you're probably going to lose something. Hand, arm, leg, or your life. Deeper into the mountains, snow fighters Derek and Brett are still struggling to free a frozen switch. What a switch does, it just moves a point over to allow us to enter a siding track or continue straight on a main track. Let's just try to open it. Switch is cleaned, it lines both directions, no problem. It's now set for the oncoming grain train. Time to head for the clear and let trains run. Twenty-five hundred kilometers east on the edge of the Arctic wilderness, the Ontario Northland Railroad is a crucial lifeline for people who live in the far north. Take it. The most extreme 300-kilometer-long section of this railway runs north from Cochrane, Ontario, up to Moosonee. Couple yet clear. If the coal's not for you, you can't be a conductor. <laughs> so you're outside half the time. You work at all the elements. For the indigenous community in Moose Factory, an island beyond the railway's northern endpoint, life can be extremely challenging. As a community, we experience a lot of uh, polar bear sightings, and it's becoming more and more frequent. One of the main reasons for polar bears uh, beginning to make their way to our communities is loss of habitat. Climate change these days is starting to affect the polar ice caps and the ice up there. There's nowhere else for them to go other than south, which is where we are, unfortunately. In the past year, we had uh, an instance where the polar bear actually made its way into the community. So we had to put it down. We're kind of at the point where we have to take some action. Just calling the bears over so we can uh, give them their afternoon meal. 300 kilometers south in Cochrane, biologist Dylan McCart works at a unique polar bear sanctuary. 
Good boy. It helps communities deal humanely with polar bear encounters. It's important to be able to live trap and relocate the bears. A better alternative than actually having to kill them. The sanctuary has designed a special trap to help the residents of Moose Factory. It will gently catch bears so they can be transported and released back into the wild. Do you want to go inside and hook that up? Sure. A bucket of bait is connected to a series of pulleys and cables. The bait that we would be using would normally be seal meat, and that will bring the bears right into the trap. So Sydney's going to be our bear today. Pull on the bucket, it's going to trigger the door, the door is going to slam. Just bring the trap over to the train station right now, and it's going to be loaded onto their freight train. We're switching out the head end of the freight to go to Moose and Eve. From Cochrane, the rail crew will transport the trap 300 kilometers north, across the frozen Moose River and vast tracts of wilderness to reach the end of the line in Moosonee. From there, a helicopter pilot will airlift the trap across the icy James Bay estuary and deliver it to the island of Moose Factory. This will be the stuff that'll be on the head end. Get the guys to roll ahead. We're probably gonna roll it in backwards. Okay, sounds good. Be the safest method. Yeah. How is it on that side? Good. Yep. Swing it up. Right up against the wall. Be best. A little more. Good. Right there. All of life's essentials join the trap on board. Snowmobiles, outboard motors, uh, fruits and vegetables, all kinds of products. We get it shipped out on the freight train. The train heads north. The trap can't arrive soon enough for Moose Factory's residents. Polar bears are apex predators. They're not afraid of anything. We have a lot of elders in the community, a lot of children. It's very unsafe for our community members. In the Rockies. We are going up the North Main Line. Rob and Carrie push the three locomotives powering the grain train to full throttle to climb Kicking Horse Pass. It takes an awful lot of power. Rising to 1,600 meters, this is the highest point in the journey and one of the most challenging. This is our slide area. Possibility of slides coming down on the mountain. In this zone, the mountains are far too steep for snow to cling onto. It can slide unexpectedly. Snow slides are not as fierce as avalanches, but they can still stop a train. We only have about three miles of track that is affected by slides. We were on the grain train when a slide came down in front of us. And when we hit the slide, well, the train hit us and bunted us through it. To stop snow slides from burying the tracks, the line's pioneering engineers built a series of protective covers for the rails, called snow sheds. To make them strong, they interlocked heavy timber logs tight against the mountainside to create a sturdy retaining wall. Douglas fir posts formed an open wall on the outer side. They braced the roof with supports and topped it with thick timber planks pitched at the same angle as the mountain slope above it. When the mountains can't hold the snow, it slides downhill across the shed roof, falling well away from trains. In all, there is more than a kilometer of these protective sheds along the mountain line. The original snow sheds were built through Rogers Pass in the 1880s. Teams of woodsmen cut massive trees from the mountain. To build the walls, they squared the logs with axes. Using winches, the crews hoisted the hefty timbers one by one before adding the roof with hand-sawn planks. It took a full two years to build the initial 31 snow sheds. So far, enjoying the job. The scenery's fantastic. Railroad's the way to go. Twenty-five hundred kilometers east. Oh, 
419. Uh, the 0184 North, I'm ready to copy. Ontario Northland Railway conductor Phil Selman and engineer Jeff Glinsky are running the train carrying the polar bear trap out of Cochrane. That's actually the first time I've brought a polar bear trap up to Moose Creek. Quite the news last year when the polar bear was seen. We were in the bunkhouse sleeping during the day, and when the moon, when they shot the one, it was only a couple miles from where we're sleeping. So it's not a very nice thought. They're hunters. They'll they're looking for meat. I'm first station. My mother was uh, was a Cree. I knew I was going to be a railroader when I was little because my uncle was actually the track supervisor for here. So right after high school, I started here. They slow the train to a crawl as they approach the Moose River Bridge. If it means slowing down to 10 or 15 mile an hour, we will. It's under repair, so they have to creep across. The job is to try and get the product into the customer. We get it to Moose Knee, they have arrangements for it to go further, so we really don't want to delay it if we can. The ice over here is starting to build up a little bit. Just shows you the strength of nature. 419, 419, entering cautionary limits, Moose Knee. That was a ship spot already there. Yeah. Deep in BC's Selkirk Mountains, the snowplow crews are now clearing the track around Golden. As the roadmaster along this stretch of track, 33-year-old Nick Byer has his hands full. The joys of traveling in reverse. While plows blast the snow. See before I'm Tristan Wire, roadmaster Nick Byer on 13 over. Nick gathers his team to make a crucial repair. We have a rail to change today uh, based on a defect that was found at mile 79.8 on the Connaught track. It's needing immediate replacement so that it's not gonna break on us or possibly derail the train. Quite honestly, I'm a pretty junior guy in the position that I'm in. I became roadmaster just this past fall. I've had a lot of faith placed in me, so I hope I'm up to it. The area that I'm the roadmaster for definitely does present the most challenges in the territory. We have a lot of very steep terrain running through some of the most scenic but nasty parts of the country where we get cold temperatures, which the track itself doesn't like. If it could go wrong, it's going to go wrong here. We're going to get just over an hour to do this job before the train's going to be on top of us. We go late, that train gets stopped, and we're in a lot of trouble. It's going to be a bit of a mad scramble. Hey, Tristan, uh, where do you want me to stop? Hey, Nick, we got to proceed west there. I think we passed, right? <laughs> OK, we overshot, heading back west. Just going to creep, and hopefully she sticks out at it. Got to love winter. We are proceeding to mile 79.93 on the Kanad track. We're having a hard time locating the defect that they found. Fortunately, it's buried under snow, so we're kind of hunting a needle in a haystack as it is. The defect is an internal weakness in the rail. With only a rough guide that it's at mile 79.93, Come on. the crew begins a ground search. Of course, it won't be in an open spot. And it's all buried under ice. 79.93 should be like right in here. This is a high stress situation for us. In the Rocky Mountains, the snow shed was built to protect trains from slides coming down. Robin Carey's 15,000-ton grain train has passed safely through the snow sheds. They're now at the railroad's highest point, and they face a precarious descent. You have to control the speed more. That's the most important part. The only way down is through two long, narrow passageways carved deep inside the mountains. They're called the spiral tunnels. In about one mile, we will be entering the top spiral tunnel. They were built in 1908 to decrease the grade going down the mountain. The mountain grades are so steep in this zone that runaway trains often used to fly off the tracks. So engineers drilled and blasted two looping tunnels right through Cathedral Mountain and Mount Ogden. They reduced the incline by half using a corkscrew ramp for the trains. 
It took more than 1,000 workers two years to punch 2,000 meters of tunnel through the solid limestone. Completed in 1909, the spiral tunnels were a true engineering wonder of their age. They made the descent safer, but still not without risk. Even uh, the grades that we're dealing with now, it can be very dangerous. This train here, we're 15,000 tons going down a 2.5% grade. Physics and gravity have a tendency to cause problems, shall we say, if things go wrong. Guiding the two kilometer long train through the spiral tunnels will be no simple task for Rob. He must slow the train down to 30 kilometers an hour to guide it round the first spiral loop that drops 17 meters as it curves down. Along a switchback route, it descends even further before entering the second tunnel. The line drops another 15 meters on the curve track, then doubles back on itself once again as it rolls down into the valley. Each of the train's 448 wheels will be pushing outwards with four tons of force as it makes this corkscrew descent. We're going to be going downhill here very shortly. If I'm not careful as to how what I do with the throttle, I can rip a train apart very easily. Next thing you got to know, you got a derailment. It can get real messy real fast. The spiral tunnels, especially for someone like me who, who's just starting to go through them, they're almost kind of scary. Like, you could film a horror movie in them. If something goes wrong, it's usually bad. There's not a lot of room for error at all. This is the entrance to the top tunnel. top spiral tunnel. This might be tricky. All kinds of ice laying inside the tunnel. If we have problems inside the tunnel, then it becomes a major concern. In 1997, this 11,000 ton grain train entered the tunnel's first spiral curve too fast. 16 cars on the rear of the train flew off the track, remaining stuck inside the tunnel. The front 55 cars detached and kept going, gaining speed down the hill before crashing off the track beyond the lower tunnel. The crew of three escaped unhurt, but 800 meters of track got badly mangled. This was ground zero. This is where the train derailed inside the tunnel. the mountain is very eerie. It's very dark. It's just get on and go at a slow rate. How deep's this snow? I have no idea. West of the spiral tunnels. If we have to, we can clear here. Brutal. Here. Right there? Yeah. Okay. Nick's repair crew has found the defect. Okay, bring her in. We've come out here to make sure that we get this piece of rail changed out so that we can make sure that the line is safe. This will get to dig it, eh? As it stands now, we only have about an hour of track time. It's tough going when the ground is frozen. I think the guys that work here are probably the best ones in the system because they work in one of the hardest parts of the system. There is a train coming at us, and we can't stop it. we got to get the goods flowing, so we need to make sure that we're clear of the track before the time that it gets here. Are you between the crib? Yeah. Wicked. What do you got? 18.6. OK. How long is that real? 25 feet. Do 25 feet. That's what I was thinking. Let's do 25. Let's do that, then. Yeah. And then Jimmy Boy only has to make two cuts instead of three. At a minimum, we have to replace 18 feet. In this particular respect, we want to do 25, because the rail we have is 25 feet, so we don't have to crop it. We save ourselves a cut. Coming down, Jimmy. 
We have to be on point, work fast, and try to get her done so we don't hold up any trays. If we're not done, that train has to stop. If that train has to stop, goods aren't getting to the terminals on time. We just can't have that. It's not acceptable. Good to go up? Yep. Watch out there. Watch your feet. What's it holding on? A little bit that wasn't cut. We're under the crunch. We've got 20 minutes to half an hour, but it's going to come down to the wire. In the snowbound woods of northern Ontario, we're about 10 miles out of Moose, Moose and Eve. Phil and Jeff pilot their train carrying the polar bear trap over the last frozen river and into Moose and Eve. We delivered the polar bear trap. The job's done for another day, unless they need more. That'll do. First one I've seen like this. Now it's the job of yard supervisor Steve Ludit to unload the polar bear trap. But as the forklift moves to lift it, There's a rod underneath to lock the, the door in the back. If we pick it up as it is, we'll bend it. We're going to lock it on the frame so we don't damage it. To protect the mechanism underneath, the crew slides a block under the heavy trap. Success. Yeah, that's the rod here, see under here. Didn't damage it, so. Success. <laughs> I don't want polar bears around here. But they're coming. High in the Rocky Mountains. And let there be light. At the end of the tunnel. The front end of Robin Carey's grain train exits the first 991 meter long spiral tunnel. One down, one to go. We're coming up to the entrance to the bottom spiral tunnel. The bottom tunnel is basically half of a figure eight. You go in and you come out right underneath yourself. For a train as long as Robin carries, they'll see the tail end of their train still going into the 891 meter long tunnel as their front cab exits. If you look straight down, you'll see a track coming out of the mountain. That's where we're coming out of. Once inside the second spiral tunnel, Rob must slowly guide the 15,000 ton train around a curved ramp that drops 15 meters. The tight curve of the track will put intense pressure on the train's wheels against the rails. Then he faces one final hurdle, a straight but steeper stretch of track that leads down into the Kicking Horse River Valley, known as the Field Hill. This handle here is the automatic brake. It sets up every car on the train except for the locomotives. On trains this big, Automatic air brakes limit the speed of every car. It will be set until we get to the bottom. That's when this brake will be released. The bottom tunnel, amazing engineering feat in 1908. It's amazing that in 1908 that this was even possible. So glad we're through that. 8708 West, clear signal to Cathedral East. Oh. You can see our train up there, right above us. About uh, 4,000 feet back into our train is where those cars are. When you come out one end and see your tail end going in the other, it, it is really neat to see. 
This is where the mountain grade going into field starts. We're heading to the big hill. Get your eye more. That's it. There is a little bit that wasn't cut all the way through. That's moving, isn't it? Just ahead of Robin Carey's train. Tight. It's always tight. Nick's crew is fighting the clock to swap out a defective rail. You try and knock that spike under the rail while Keith lifts up on it. Come on, you Perfect. Give her a little bop on that end. Yeah, that that's it. it. That's good. Nothing beats a sledgehammer to solve this kind of problem. OK, that's good for now. Let's get this new one in. Good, Jimmy? Yeah. OK, going in. Bring her down. All right. To fit the new rails snug into place, they're using an innovative technique. We call them fire snakes. We light them up, <laughs> let her get hot, and then watch her grow. The crew has to cut the new rail a few centimeters short of the gap that it needs to fill. That's because temperatures here vary wildly as the seasons change. If the team cuts the rail to fit the gap precisely during this freezing winter weather, when the summer comes, the new rail would expand under the heat of the sun and cause the track to buckle out of alignment. So the team cuts the rail short and uses burning alcohol gel to heat it up. This way, the rail can expand without buckling when the seasons change. We have half an hour. OK. The fire snake heats up the rail to the point where it expands so we can get our joint bars back on and everything will look good. Well, we're under the crunch. Something goes wrong here, we're going to be late. As the rail expands into position, Nick's crew pounds the final spikes into place. We have three minutes to be clear. Let's get the out of here. This is success, but we still got to get in the clear before our time's up. So we're going to saddle up right now and get on the way. Just east of Nick's crew. We're about to start going down the hill. Rob and Carrie's next challenge is the tricky descent down Field Hill into the valley below. Sometimes you can get into very serious problems on the field hill. Biggest concern would be how well it breaks going down the side of the mountain. In the wintertime, the braking system does not work as well as it does in the summertime. Freezing temperatures can cause parts of the train's braking system to contract, reducing braking efficiency. Right now, I'm just conditioning the brakes, getting them ready to go down the hill. Begin mountain grade. Downhill from here. Most of the hill would be 15 miles per hour. Depending on the size of the train. As for the subdivision itself, max speed would be 45 miles per hour? 50. 50 miles per hour. I'm not an engineer yet, as you can tell. I've got probably the second fastest speed down this field hill. The only one that beat me was the train that derailed. This train's not gonna, it's not gonna lose that fight. 35 years experience gives Rob an innate feel for how far he can push his train. You gotta be cautious. That's where the other half of the train went over the side of the mountain. Where it went over the edge. Is it named after the conductor or the engineer? Named after the conductor. It's now known as Gilbert's Gulch. You don't want to have an accident on the railway because they'll name it after you. Well, that's a fair statement. <laughs> it definitely is. We are arriving in beautiful downtown field. Every time I come on a train, the engineers have so much knowledge about the subdivision they work on, and they have their own way of getting their train down the hill safely. It's actually quite amazing. Halfway across Canada in Moosonee. Easy. There's wires on this side here. Make sure it doesn't catch onto this, I'll break it off. Helicopter pilot Chris Eden is hooking up the polar bear trap so he can airlift it to the island of Moose Factory. The only way to get it across, unless if you wait until uh, the river thaws out, then they get the barge in. 
Then I can bring it over by barge. You want to just make sure that it's all equal and level so it flies nice. It gets pretty hairy at times when things can get spinning. It's rocking, swinging back and forth, so you feel all of that. But just as they gear up for takeoff, clouds threaten to obscure visibility. To see where he's going, Chris would need to fly beneath them at a level of just 200 feet. We have to be within gliding distance of shore if our engine fails. And if we're only 200 feet off the ground, you lose your engine, you might not make it. And it's, that river's cold and it's moving pretty quick. At the helipad in Moussanee. Wait and see what happens. Chris waits for clear skies to airlift the polar bear trap to the island of Moose Factory. Right now is looking better. It should be on this side any minute, and I uh, can't wait to receive it. Ready to depart the airport with your sling load. Roger. Simmons, Oscar Delta India is off expedition. Chris needs to keep the load steady. If it spins out of control over the icy river, it could bring the helicopter down. Spinning a little bit. Nice and slow. It's rocking. Hey, Moose Factory, I'm on my way with the load. After a precarious six-kilometer journey, touchdown. This spare trap made quite a journey all the way from Cochrane, Ontario, via rail, via helicopter, to Moose Factory. So I'm glad I made it in one piece. Warren can now use the trap to help protect the lives of both Moose Factory's people and its polar bears. We're glad to take some positive action on the polar bear activity in the area and have a humane option to relocate these animals. Three thousand kilometers west. The scenery is very good out here. Rob and Carrie are through the Rocky Mountains and across Nick's new track. This is one of those jobs where you have to have an open mind and continue to learn every day you're out here. It's just gonna take time. When you got someone who's willing to help, it it makes your job so much easier as a new hire conductor. This is where we get off the train. It was a long trip. Time to get some rest. Another crew handles the final leg of the trip into Vancouver. At the port, belts and chutes channel all 15,000 tons of grain into the ship's massive hull. Hey, guys. Good day today? Yeah. yeah. The grain can't sit idle in one spot or one tank for very long. We got to keep the process moving. We used to open these cars up manually. Now our operators can sit in a booth with a joystick and a computer screen. This is much like sitting at home playing a video game. This shipment will head to markets in Europe and the Middle East for pasta production. Canadian Pacific's heavy haul grain train has done its job. safely transporting its precious load through tunnels from hell and ice-encrusted mountains to put food on tables across the world, all on account of the brave crews who battle the brutal weather to keep this crucial lifeline running. In the winter months on the mountains, the biggest challenges we have are winter itself, where you may have avalanches one day and then be fighting with an overnight snowfall of six feet the next the pace that you operate at, the responsibility that's placed on you, 
honestly, this job gets addictive. Next time. This isn't good. A colossal load. You're not going to survive at those speeds with that weight. And creaking bridges. If you're afraid of heights, this is not the job for you. Push the crew over the edge. Start telling me, OK? I'm sick of this. Yeah.